Well, today, the most clownish British prime minister of our lifetimes announced his humiliating resignation pending the choice of a successor and thereby demonstrated once again the superiority of the British parliamentary system over the system chosen by our founders who believed they were smarter in deciding to lock the country into fixed four-year terms of presidents who we now know, for partisan reasons, cannot be removed no matter what crimes they're caught committing. The founders' obsession to avoid all things British in government led them to the creation of the most grotesque institution ever imposed on a so-called democracy, the Electoral College. The only reason to worry about the fairness of the next presidential election is the Electoral College. Without the Electoral College, no problem. The Electoral College is one of the founders' many crimes against democracy. Other crimes against democracy by the founders include two senators per state, not allowing anyone other than a small percentage of white men to vote, and not allowing anyone to vote for United States senators. The founders were experimenters in democracy, not true believers in democracy. They were dabblers in democracy. Many of their obstacles to democracy that they put in the Constitution have been removed. Women are now allowed to vote. Black people are allowed to vote. Everyone now at least has the right to vote, the theoretical right to vote, while Republicans continue to try to make that right more difficult to exercise. But the unmovable roadblock to democracy in our presidential elections is the Electoral College, something that does not exist in any other country on the planet. Republicans have completely given up the hope of ever winning more votes for president than the Democratic candidate. It's been 18 years since the Republican candidate for president won more votes than the Democratic candidate for president. Democratic candidates for president now routinely win millions more votes than the Republican. And so the only hope for the Republican to win, as we saw in 2016, was to somehow win the Electoral College. Prior to the year 2000, every winning candidate for president won the most votes and won the Electoral College. And so the Electoral College was mostly just a theoretical factor lurking in the background of presidential campaigns. Now, the Electoral College is everything. Joe Biden won Pennsylvania's 20 electoral votes in the last election. Donald Trump won those 20 electoral votes four years earlier. And now, Donald Trump has a plan to win Pennsylvania's electoral votes again. And this time, Donald Trump won't have to win the most votes in Pennsylvania to win Pennsylvania's electoral votes because as we heard on this program last night from Harvard Law Professor and former Republican Solicitor General Charles Freed, the radical majority on the Supreme Court may be participating in what he called a slow motion coup d'etat. The radical majority on the Supreme Court has agreed to hear a case that could allow state legislatures to choose the electors for the Electoral College, no matter which candidate gets the most votes in that state. Pennsylvania is one of the states where that could happen. And the Republican nominee for governor wants it to happen. The Republican nominee for governor, State Senator Doug Mastriano, was plotting with Rudy Giuliani to try to figure out how to give Donald Trump Pennsylvania's electoral votes last time, even though Joe Biden won the most votes in Pennsylvania. It was legally impossible to do. Now, there was some falsely alarmist written analysis at the time in some publications suggesting that the Pennsylvania legislature could do that. But that analysis was always totally wrong about Pennsylvania in 2016, because at the time, the Pennsylvania legislature would have had to quickly pass a law retroactively giving themselves the authority to name electors, and that law would have had to be signed by the governor, who is a Democrat, and was never going to sign that law. 
So the alarm in 2016 was a false alarm in Pennsylvania. The Supreme Court might just decide, though, that even though the Pennsylvania legislature has passed a law, like all other legislatures, delegating their authority to name electors to the voters who choose the electors through the voting process, that same legislature can then simply decide to seize the power back to name electors at any time without passing a new law. The Supreme Court might give them that power. And if the Republican candidate for governor wins in November in Pennsylvania, he will help them do that. And we may be sitting here in 2024 watching presidential election in Pennsylvania being stolen while it is also being stolen in other swing states with Republican legislatures and the coup d'etat will be complete and it will be televised. And the day that happens, the United States of America, as we know it, ceases to exist. That is what's on the ballot in November in the state where the United States of America was created. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania was the place where the Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776. Eleven years later, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the Constitution of the United States of America was written and agreed to by the then 13 states. The place where the United States was born may be the place where it dies. Nothing less than that is on the ballot in Pennsylvania in November of this year and in other states that could elect Republican governors and Republican legislatures who are already plotting to steal the next presidential election because the Electoral College allows them to steal it. Without the Electoral College, Republicans stealing the presidential election would be mathematically impossible. They could never create enough fake votes in states like Arizona or Georgia or Pennsylvania to flip the national vote totals because in California alone, Joe Biden got five million more votes than Donald Trump. In New York, Joe Biden got two million more votes than Donald Trump. Every other country in the world that is watching Donald Trump and Republicans plot to steal the next presidential election knows that the only way they can do that is the Electoral College. And this is screamingly obvious to other countries because no other country has an electoral college. They look at it in wonder. Every element of the criminal conspiracy that Donald Trump was running in 2020 to try to overturn the outcome of the presidential election was a manipulation of the electoral college. That's it. That's the only way. Most Republican voters in Pennsylvania did not vote for Doug Mastriano in the Republican primary for governor. 56% of Republicans voted for other candidates. Many of the Republicans who voted against Doug Mastriano agree with the nine prominent Pennsylvania Republican leaders who have come out today in support of the Democratic candidate for governor in Pennsylvania because the future of the very existence of the United States of America as we know it is at stake in the governor's election in Pennsylvania. Former Congressman Charlie Dent is one of the leaders of the Republicans endorsing Democrat Josh Shapiro for governor of Pennsylvania. He's joined by a former Republican Speaker of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives and a former Republican Lieutenant Governor. These Republicans are endorsing the Democrat because they believe that the Republican candidate for governor in Pennsylvania is dangerous. That's their word. Dangerous. Republican Charlie Dent says that the Republican candidate, quote, is an extremist who is a threat to the rule of law and the constitutional order. The rule of law, law and constitutional order are strong words for politicians, but they are way too dry and academic sounding for what actually is at stake. The United States will no longer be united if Pennsylvania Republicans steal the Pennsylvania presidential election in 2024. The United States itself 
is what is at stake. The word united will have no meaning if Pennsylvania steals the presidential election. Pennsylvania will not be united with its neighboring state of New York, which will deliver at least two million more votes for the Democratic candidate. Republicans in Pennsylvania, led by their Republican candidate for president, are plotting not just a crime against Pennsylvania voters, but a crime against the voters in every other state. Republicans who have turned against Donald Trump and Trump supporting candidates are generally described as anti-Trump, sometimes described as never Trumpers. That's not what they stand for now. They do not stand simply in opposition to the worst candidate for president in history and the worst president in history, Donald Trump. They now stand in support of preserving the United States of America and preserving the United States of America by preserving fair elections. Republicans like Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger on the January 6th committee who take a stand against Republicans find themselves in conflict with family and friends and former friends. The state of Missouri is now seeing such a personal conflict, deeply personal conflict between friends. Eric Greitens is running for Senate. He was forced to resign as governor after allegations of sexual misconduct and campaign finance violations. In a country ravaged by mass murders, Eric Greitens made this campaign ad. Join the MAGA crew, get a rhino hunting permit. There's no bagging limit, no tagging limit, and it doesn't expire until we save our country. After seeing that ad, Ken Harbo, a friend who has attended Eric Greitens' weddings, released this video. Eric, I want you to know that there are worse things in life than running for office honorably and losing. Trust me, I've done that. What you're doing now is not honorable, and it is not a reflection of the Eric I knew. Even if you do win, you're going to lose more than you can imagine by campaigning like this. You're called to hunt down Republicans who disagree with you? That's my mom, Eric. Just because she doesn't think the election was stolen, and let's be honest, you don't either, is not a reason to threaten her. She was one of the few people to reach out when you were forced to resign as governor. She wrote to you about grace and redemption. She reminded you that even the greatest sins, those against one's own family, can be forgiven. My kids, who you've played Legos with, Eric, are going to ask someday what I did for my country in this moment of peril. Yours are going to ask, too. I know that weighs on you. Eric, what you're doing now is going to get someone killed. Do the right thing. Drop out. Focus on repairing the damage you have done. And pray it's not too late. Folks are joining our campaign, including those prominent Republicans who endorsed us yesterday. Um, one, because they know that I've got a track record of bringing people together to actually get things done, to actually solve problems and make their lives better. And two, and I think you cited Congressman Dent earlier, that um, they fundamentally believe that my opponent is a threat to the rule of law and the constitutional order, and that he is out there to try and undermine our freedoms. You know, look, my, my opponent talks every day about uh, freedom. He, he loves to cloak himself in this blanket of freedom. Um, but here's what I know. It, it's not freedom when you tell a woman what she can do with her body, as he is known to do. It, it's not freedom when he gets to tell me what books my kids are allowed to read in school. And it sure as hell isn't freedom when he says, yeah, you all can go vote in Pennsylvania, but I'll choose the winner. That's not freedom. And this is a man who's trying to take away our freedoms, trying to undermine the rule of law, and disturb the constitutional order. And that is why Republicans are joining our campaign to go together with Democrats and independents, and why we will win in November and defend our democracy. And joining us now is Sister Simone Campbell, former executive director of the Catholic Advocacy, Advocacy Group Network and leader of Nuns on the Bus. And as you can see right now, 
a 2022 recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Sister, thank you very much for joining us tonight on this very important night in your life. Uh, and I saw that moment um, once that medal was around your neck when your hand couldn't resist and had to go up to feel that it was real. Absolutely. I, I was so stunned. It was such a dear moment of being honored, but also disbelief that the work that we do every day that just seems natural could receive such recognition was a, a humbling honor. And that it wasn't just me. It was all my sisters around the country who were being honored in the process. It was it was stunning. I, I know uh, you and I know many nuns and I know that there is no nun who has ever entered service in the hope of getting a medal of any kind. <laughs> and so uh, it's it was really something to see today. You know, I was there once. I was there in 2011 uh, with Bill Russell when Bill Russell, former mm. Boston Celtics, great, uh, when President Obama had to reach up to get that medal <laughs> around around his neck. And I have to say, he was uncharacteristically kind of speechless afterwards. How long did it take you after the fact to, to be able to put a sentence together? Well, I'm not sure I've arrived at the moment where I can put a sentence together yet. Um, I, I think that the level of disbelief really comes from who I was with on that stage. I mean, it was so awesome to be with Mr. Gray, who had represented the civil rights folks, and and to be with, I mean, I sat next to Simone Biles, who, this young gymnast, but who was so strong and powerful in her claim of mental health and her own needs. I, I, it was just, uh, as you could tell, I'm still speechless, but it was such an honor to be with them. You have uh, forsaken material goods in, in this life that you've chosen. Uh, what would you say to people about what they should value, especially young people who are beginning their careers? Oh, uh, to value deeply, having time in your lives to listen deeply to what's needed and to respond to those needs, as opposed to what can I get out of it or you know, thinking that I have one direct path. I never thought of this as a path, you know, to the Medal of Freedom. It's like, how, how do you do that? But to listen and respond to the needs around us, to the cries that we hear. And everyone hears cries in different ways. So listen and then respond. That's where the hope of our nation is, is that we can do this. It, it is possible. Uh, Sister Simone Campbell, uh, thank you for joining us very on this important night. Thank you for your service. Uh, thank you for everything you did to earn that medal. Oh, thank you, Lawrence. An honor to be with you. Thanks for this opportunity.